This is the Tip Top Podcast, the T-I-P-P-T-O-P podcast, hosted by myself, Keaton Ditchfield, and we talk about everything to do with the outdoors. That's fishing, camping, hunting, birds, wildlife, conservation, and a whole lot more. This podcast is as raw, untamed, unedited, and unapologetic as nature. So buckle up. This is the Tip Top Podcast. Now, that bass guy, for those who don't know, is a bass fishing channel on YouTube. It's a very cool bass fishing channel on YouTube um, where Adam goes out and catches bass everywhere. He's caught bass, oh, we've lost him. We've caught, he's caught bass from Borskorp to the Cape to all kinds of places. He's a prolific bass angler and knows how to work them out. I've learned quite a few things from him. Yes, there he is. Hello, Adam. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, I'm bored. <laughs> You're bored, very, stuck very in a... bored. How's, yeah. how's the family going? How's everyone? Yeah, I'm going, going all right. Uh, yeah, I don't have kids. Okay, uh, wonderful. In the virus lockdown situation. Okay. Um, so how's, how's lockdown? You're being bored. Have you been neat, neatening all your gear? Have you been fixing up for the next fishing trip? Just no. chilling. Yeah, we've we've been doing a lot of cuts, um, you know, bits and pieces. I'm lucky enough where I can actually work, so I've been doing a bit of work here and there. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to ignore the fishing stuff because it just it makes me sad. <laughs> it makes us all sad. <laughs> um, so tell us, how did you how did you get into fishing? What started you on your fishing fishing journey? And did you start fishing for bass, or did you start fishing for other things? Uh, no, um, shucks, my, my dad was a big fisherman, so, uh, um, am I still there? Yeah, are you still there? I can still hear you. The signal's not oh, great. sorry, it buffered. No. Uh, let me see if I can move, if I move. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so anyways, um, my dad was a big fisherman, so, I mean, I've got pictures of me holding fishing rods when I was three years old uh, but we grew up in Durban so I grew up salt rock and surf fishing saltwater fishing okay um, and then when I was about 15 I think we moved up to Joburg and obviously there's no saltwater fishing there so I uh, picked up a bass rod and that's pretty much the end of my life <laughs> you've been stuck ever since stuck yeah <laughs> happily stuck but stuck Okay. And what made you start that bass guy? Your Can you tell the guys about your channel? I, sure. I said a little bit about it, but yeah, what made you start it? What yeah. is it? All that kind of stuff. Uh, my word. Um, I don't actually know why I started it, to be very honest. Um, I think, if I remember right, I mean, I was watching a lot of the, the American YouTube channels and that, um, and I thought, you know, I could probably do something like that. I mean, probably not to the level that they're doing it, but, you know, why not? Um, and, and, I mean, it was always fun sharing photos and things with people. And I thought, well, why not share a video? No one else at that stage in the country was doing anything like that. So yeah. I thought, well, you know, why not? Um, let's give it a go and see what happens. And, yeah, that's, that's pretty much that. And what, what, what gear did you start with? Like, you obviously had your fishing gear, but what, what did you start your channel with? Like, like camera gear? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, that's going back a long time. I think, if I remember right, I bought one of those strange GoPro, cheap GoPro things from China. Uh, started with that, and it cost me 400 bucks. I thought, well... If this never works ever again, then, you know, it's not the end. I started with that. Uh, film quality was rubbish. <laughs> At, uh, you can see from my very early videos, the, the, the resolution is 720. Um, and it's really grainy and the audio is rubbish. <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't great. Yeah, that's, that's a starter, I think, generally. Okay. Is um, it... And then slowly moved up and, and bought some better stuff. Lacquer. And is there a way you can move closer to your router? Because we bre we're breaking up a little bit. Sorry. Let me see. Might be a bit difficult. Uh, no worries. Um, 
Just because the audio, okay. I don't know, the audio sometimes breaks out and the guys, we're all trying to hear your, what you're telling us, but then we, we, we're struggling to hear a little bit. <laughs> um, so yeah, you started like that and then you just started. Did you start in Joburg or did you start in Cape Town with your channel? Yeah, so I mean, the channel's now about, four, years old, five years old, I think. So I've been in Cape Town now for about three years. So I've been doing it in Joburg for a bit and that's where I started um, and then yeah I came down here and it, 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 I think what was nice is it kind of refreshed the channel a bit because it wasn't the same areas same dams um, fishing the same thing so it was it was actually quite a nice change and then in in um, the Cape you get more smallmouth bass eh? yes the, the lovely smallmouth why don't we get smallmouth bass in Joburg there, there are a couple places that have them, actually. Um, okay. I know Lost Corp Dam does have smallmouth in it. Very few, and they're very hard to catch. But occasionally, once every three, four years, a smallmouth pops out of there. Yeah. Um, and then there's another dam. I don't know the name of it, but it's up Nelspray type area. And, and I know that place has got a lot of smallmouth. Uh, but obviously not a lot of people know about it. And I, I don't even know the name. I just know it exists. So if so, you drove there, yeah. you'd go there. But other than that, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I don't know the, the main reason. Um, a lot of guys say, you know, the, the massive barbel population that are up there. Um, because to give a bit of background, you know, largemouth when they're spawning, you know, if a big barbel comes up, the, the female will run away. Whereas um, with a small mouth, you'll fight that until that bubble inhales him and, and then he's gone. So the small mouth put up a mud in terms of protecting the nest. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, to the detriment often. So a lot of people say the bubble population is wiped out. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't take much of a big barbel to eat a one maybe one and a half kilo smallmouth and the no, smallmouth uh, don't they don't really no, grow that big yeah exactly so yeah i mean uh, a one kg largemouth is is quite a bit bigger than a kg smallmouth so yeah easy easy food for a big barbel and they, yeah they're quite a they're quite an aggressive like dense little little bugger and so for our for our, yeah. our our listeners who maybe don't know can you just explain a couple of the differences um that there are between a large mouth and a small mouth bass for those who don't know sure well the obvious one is the mouth size um yeah uh what else so like you said they're, they're quite dense so a small mouth is if i put it like this a small mouth is a a backline rugby player, very lean, lots of muscle, fast, uh, whereas a, a large mouth, not, not necessarily a prop, but more, you know, like an eight man type thing, nice and bulky, very strong, um, but a little bit lazier and a little bit slower. Okay. Um, yeah. And then obviously color, a uh, small mouth tend to be a lot more brownish. Yeah. Um, and they, they hold a lot more to like the rocky areas whereas largemouth uh, will hold to rocks as well, but, um, you know, they'll, they'll seek out vegetation a lot more than a smallmouth. And then for, like, things like sunken trees, would a smallmouth or, or largemouth prefer it? Uh, yeah, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. Uh, okay. I mean, if there's only sunken trees in the dam, then, you know, a smallmouth will hold to it. Uh, if there's a lot of big boulders and sunken trees, the smallmouth would probably gravitate towards the boulders more than the trees. Okay. And then I remember one of the things of advice that you gave me, because when I did my one and only smallmouth session, it's all thanks to this man right here. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was in the Cape, and he, he told me that once you, with, with largemouth bass, if you catch bass that are sub kilo so under a kilo you can keep fishing that area and there will be quite a few of them but with small mouth bass there's usually one there and then you move spots yeah pretty much why do you think that is because they because they're pretty aggressive or they don't like schooling or or what uh, well again that that's very 
it's very area dependence or, or water body dependence. Okay. Um, some areas you'll find schools are small enough. Um, other dams, you know, and I think it's got a lot to do with population density and also time of year. So in the, the cooler months, you'll find a lot more schooling fish. Same with largemouth. Um, the warmer months, especially the bigger ones, you know, they'll they'll spread out, they'll they'll have their territories, and they'll stay in that territory. And smallmouth are, I think, far more territorial than largemouth. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's got a lot to do with it. Um, small a largemouth will will roam around. They'll have their large area that they kind of feed off, but a smallmouth will, will hone in on a a big rock pile or you know a tree or whatever. Um, and they'll, they'll stay there a lot longer than a large mouth. Okay, and then them staying in, like, in winter when both species tend to school more, do you think it's because of them looking for warmer water? Or is it a protection thing? Or what, what do you mm. think is the reason for that? Well, I mean, if you think of the whole ecosystem, um, your bait fish will, will school up, and then so will the predatory fish. Um, you know, and, and yes, the, the water will have very... You'll have limited comfortable areas in the water, um, you know, because you know a lot of people think you know fish or, or bass will gravitate to the warmer spots, which is not necessarily true. They'll gravitate towards the more comfortable spots. So, okay. if the shallows fluctuate really, you know, high and low, you probably won't find fish, and that's why there's not a lot of fish in the shallows, even though the shallows are warmer than the deeper water. Um, you know, during the day. Yeah. Uh, so the bass are trying to find like a stable temperature. Um, and that's why they go deeper because the, the temperatures don't fluctuate so much. Okay. So it's more, well, I guess if you like with fish tank fish, if you change the temperature too quickly, you'll kill them. And so I guess they're looking exactly. for, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. Why? Cause I was thinking, why do fish go to the bottom during winter? Even if, if they're always looking for heat, meanwhile the bottom of a dam is usually colder than the top of the dam. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then at night, the shallows will get a lot colder than that deeper water. So yeah, they're just looking for a comfortable spot to chill, basically. Okay. And do you, have you ever fished for bass at night? Plenty. My my personal best came at about ten o'clock at night. So that's an amazing yeah. thing. Um, yeah, uh, I know a lot of people that their personal best have come after it went dark or, um, or whatever. And, and interesting enough, I read not too long ago that, uh, that bass actively feed at night versus during the day. So during the day, you're going to get those peaks, you know, early morning, late afternoon, where you'll catch more fish. But if you had to actually put in the effort and go fishing properly at night, you'll probably end up catching far bigger fish um, than what you would during the day. That's very interesting. I guess they see less, so yeah. there's less to give away that it's a lure versus the instinct bite. So then why don't why don't yeah. all competitions run for 20, like, because I know carp competitions run for a couple of days. Why don't bass guys do it? Because I know bass guys, they go in the morning and then at like three or four, half past four, yeah. it's cut off. And why don't they go a 24, yeah. 24 hour session? I think it's very difficult to fish at night because you can't see structure. You know, bass, you've got to find structure. You've got to find the tree. You've got to find the grass. So fishing at night is going to be very difficult because, uh, you know, you're going to cast to a tree or a bush and you're going to cast into the tree or bush. Um, and it just ends up being very frustrating. So I think, I think that's the main reason. Safety is also a big concern because you're on a boat. Um, yeah. So, you know, boating at night is most places it's illegal so yeah not a good idea interesting That's probably the main reason why this has happened okay because yeah that it, it would make sense to catch more fish but it would be, it'd be also quite fun for the challenge yeah. of like then you're really testing your skills because yeah. i know at night when there's yeah, no light absolutely. i think i'm casting straight but it's always to the left <laughs> but yeah, yeah but exactly. the safety thing makes a lot of sense because you don't want like it's all good and well saying it's a challenge, you're going to catch more fish. But if some people get hurt, it's not worth it. Yeah. And fishing at yeah, night, exactly. fishing exactly. at night, what would you suggest? Because I know a lot of guys say if it's fishing at night, use black lures. 
Yes. Um, you know, it just creates that nice silhouette, especially if there's a bit of moonlight or whatever, they're, they're going to see it a lot easier. Um, summertime, if you're fishing at night, which is probably when you're going to do it because it's way too cold uh, at winter, but top water lures, frogs, buzz baits especially, um, you know, spinner baits, anything that moves and that will, will trigger that fish's reaction uh, guaranteed to have success. Uh, but in saying that, I've caught fish on, you know, slow Texas rig work, just popping it off the bottom and the fish still pick it up. So we think they can't see, but they know exactly what's happening in that water. It's amazing how, how we underestimate fish. And there's also a word for it. It's, it the word means putting human traits onto animals. And we put human traits onto yeah. animals all the time. We think fish can see better than us. Ach, we think we can see the same as the yeah. fish. But the see, fish can see better than yeah. us. Like, I know carp can see in ultraviolet light. And yeah. we can't. But we go, no, carp can't yeah. see at night. Meanwhile, <laughs> they know what's cooking. Yeah. They and, know what's happening. Absolutely. And for evolution, if you're looking back in evolution... The eye was developed for underwater and then adapted to above water. So even if even yeah. if you're an eagle, your eyes are second hand. They're not they're not yeah. original original technology, <laughs> if you could put it that way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you you've started off fishing in um in Joburg and then you fished uh, you fished in Durban, Joburg and and the Cape. Why? Which one is your favorite and why? Sure. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. I'm going to say the Cape because they've got smallmouth. Um, and I mean, I know a lot of guys listening probably haven't caught a smallmouth before. Um, and so you won't really understand. But uh, I mean, if you hook into a, a one kg smallmouth, you, you're probably fighting a two, two and a half kg largemouth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the fight per, per kg is just insane. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, it would be very difficult to give up smallmouth. Um, the, the downside to that is the Cape doesn't have as many big bats as Joburg does um, in terms of our largemouth. So, I mean, to catch a 3 kg, 4 kg largemouth down here is, you know, it's something that it's an adventure. It's something you, you hope for and probably won't get to do. But, uh, you know, some guys have done it. Some guys have caught five kg fish down here, but it's a lot more rare than, than up in Joburg. Okay. Or that area. We've got a question from Mohammed. He says, what is the best bass combo for 2,000 rand and under? Um, bamboo and some monofilament. <laughs> Why is it? Is everything um, expen too expensive? No, I mean, shucks. A lot of my combinations, um, I do a bit of guiding as well, so I don't have the most expensive things because I am giving it to strangers to to fish with. Um, but if if you look at um, the Akuma Tactical Range, yeah, they're, they're fantastic rods. Uh, and I'm not I'm not sponsored by by them or anything. I just use them because they're affordable and, and quite strong um, and very light. They weigh nothing. So if you had to go Akuma Tactical Range, um, I think a bait caster rod will set you back about 600 to 700 rand. Um, and then you know a good Abu Garcia Revo reel, you know another thousand five or so. So you'll probably hit around that 2000 rand mark yeah um yeah look a lot of guys go for when they start out they go for the the abu Garcia black max um and without speaking bad about anything you're going to yeah. struggle <clears throat> um it's a very basic reel and nine out of ten guys that try it for their first bait caster end up giving up on bait casters because you know your bait casters are difficult as it is yeah. And if you're going to add a, a cheaper entry level thing, you're going to just struggle. Okay. It's just that simple. And do you, are you 100% set on, on bait casters versus coffee grinders? <clears throat> yeah, yes and no. 
Um, look for, for smaller lures, drop shots, um, lighter crankbaits, you know, you got to go with spinning rods. So, you know, I've got, on my kit boat or boat, I've got four spinning rods at all times because there's just certain applications that you have to use a spinning rod. Um, but then that being said, the, the casting rods, if you're going to go for jigs, uh, bigger top water lures uh, or swim baits or anything like that, you're going to need a bait casting rod because it's just got far more power in the backbone to cast those rods or those lures. Um, yeah, you just you're gonna you're gonna end up missing fish because you can't get those hooks and those big lures set into the mouth properly. Uh, so they they each have their place realistically. Interesting, because I've I've used plenty of of bait, bait casters and. I've no, I know how to cast them, and they they cast pretty easy. But I prefer um, yeah. braid and and a, and a coffee grinder. This those fix spools. I just yeah. and I, I think it does take a bit of getting used to because you've got to treat yeah. you, with with a bait runner. It's very easy to stop that bait and to and to organize things, and you've got that thumb ready to stop that line at any point. Yeah. With yeah. with the coffee grinders or the fix spools. You've actually got to learn where your line is. You've got to catch it. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to yeah. pull it out and swing it. It's it's not a, it's not as straightforward as a bait runner. So I understand why people use bait runners, but I don't think for someone like for Muhammad who's looking for a two thousand rand setup uh, to get started. I don't know if he's getting started or not. I, don't, I just know he asked that question. But for those who would like to start yeah. bass fishing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with getting going for a seven foot. Rod with a coffee grind, uh, with a coffee grinder or fixed pool to get you going. Start catching yeah. fish, start enjoying the sport, and then once you start okay. to yeah. take it more seriously, then then you can start practicing buying your first bait, maybe buying that that mm. bait runner you you ex you just uh, explained, and then go from there and practice and put your hours in. But when we did our um, our first session. In the Cape together, you used uh, yeah. an interesting bait runner there. Is that not a not an option to to start with? Because I remember you said it was quite uh, quite well priced. But if if yeah. I don't know, I'd... Mm. Uh, well, just going back to what you're saying about the you know starting out, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, often when people ask me questions about tackle, uh, I think about what I would do. But yeah, absolutely. If you're starting out, start with a spinning reel. Um, you know, you're only going to get to those bigger lures and the more complicated lures at late stage anyway. So um, yeah, if you're starting out, go with a, a seven foot, like you said, the Kuma Tactical's got a spinning rod as well. Um, and I usually use the Akuma, I think it's called a Cayenne or Cyan or something like that. Um, I just like Akuma because it's a decent product and the you know, you're not going to pay an arm and a leg for it. So yeah. with that setup, you're probably looking at about a thousand, thousand two hundred bucks. No, there you go. Um, you know, rod and reel. So to me, that that's that's a great option if you're starting out. Um, and then, yeah, the uh, the the brand that you're talking about is a Cast King brand. Um, I, I get them from China, uh, from AliExpress. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, China, blah blah blah. Everything's made in China, number one. Yeah, um, let's not, let's not even pretend. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's made in the same factories. Um, you know, a lot of the components are exactly the same. So, yeah. Uh, but um, if I think quickly about pricing, you can get a good a good bait casting reel from Casting. Um, and I think landed, you end up paying about 600, 700 grand. Um, obviously, dollar dependent. But, yeah. uh, you know, shucks. Versus two, three, four thousand rand. Uh, you know, if it does break in a year, you can just buy another one. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but with that, that being said, most of them are about six years old. Yeah, but with with we did, when we discussed it when we were fishing, you said with those Chinese models, you've got to find the right one, and yeah. it might take you a couple of broken reels to find the right model that is actually a a quality model that's worth spending money on yeah. which is the ones you found you've put those things through the ringers yeah, caught exactly. a lot of fish yeah yeah exactly like i said i mean i've had two out of the probably 12 or so that i've bought that have given up on me uh but i do fish a lot and i fish hard and i don't service them because you know they're, they're cheaper reels so 
I don't bother servicing them. I don't bother spending three, four hundred rand servicing the reel because that's almost what it costs. Um, so, and I mean, a lot of them are still running strong. It's four, five, six years old, I think, is my oldest one. Uh, yeah, I mean, Casking is a reputable brand. There's some actual um, FLW pros that are now using Casking reels. So, you know, some of the guys in the States, the big bass tournament guys, they, they've jumped onto the casting bandwagon. Um, you know, so it's not some funny Chinese brand. It's actually an American company that ships out of the out of China to save costs. Okay. And that, that's actually what it is. Yeah, and it helps a lot when you're not going through three middlemen to get your stuff because those three middlemen exactly. don't need to make their money on top of the same thing. <laughs> exactly. So, speaking of our session and stuff like that, when you took me out, you had a small boat that was really great. I think it was a fantastic setup. You had a small yeah. boat, you had a, a, a trolling motor, an electric, um, oh, electric, a battery to power it, and then you had this yeah. mofo um, fish yeah. finder on it, which probably cost as much as the boat. <laughs> yeah, uh, more, here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, explain, please explain to all of us myself included, or you already have to me, but to everyone, why you invested that, why you invested your money in that way, where you'd buy a boat to get you around, but then bought the fish, yeah. the, the fish finder you wanted. Sure. Um, well. Oh, we've lost him. No. Internet connection, you suck. This always happens with the internet, and it's like, Wait, we lost you. We're going to have to start again on that question. Yeah, sorry. I, I've got a phone call. <laughs> oh, there you <laughs> go. Things. No problem. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it's very dependent because I fish a lot of farm dams, as you know. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's no slipways. There's no way to get a, a bigger boat in there, uh, number one. Number two, the dams aren't very big. So in the Cape, we've only got three big dams uh, realistically mm. um, and I don't really fish any of them because uh, the farm dams and the other dams that I fish fish better than the big dams anyway. And you and you don't have 300 other anglers trying to fish for the same fish? Sorry. sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so I decided, you know, get myself a, a cheaper little boat. Adam is obviously very popular right now. Someone's got to, trying to get hold of him very urgently. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so joys you were saying that <laughs> you was yeah, Joyce. You were saying that um, these farm dams are quite difficult to get into. Like I remember, we had to carry your boat down a an embankment just to get it into the water. Yeah. Um, and you're yeah, not exactly. It, you don't fish those big venues because the small dams fish better, and then. Also, is there's less traffic on the small dams, eh? Well, exactly. I mean, generally, it's me and maybe one or two other people, if that, that ever fish those dams. So, um, you know, the, it's very difficult. It's very controversial because a lot of people say, well, you know, cool, you've got private venues, you know, share with me. And it, it's very, very difficult um, to share venues because, you know, you share with the wrong guy and suddenly they are just, you know, they, they're ruined and the farmer says, well, that's it, I'm banning fishing for everybody and it's happened to me a couple of times. So, yeah. it's very difficult to share spots. Yeah, um, I, I totally so, agree. Yeah, but, uh, back, mm, back to your question about the boat. Um, you know, that's number one. It's easy to cart around by myself and launch by myself. Um, and then the reason for the fish finder is because a cheap fish finder is a cheap fish finder. Um you know, you're not going to get the, the, the quality of reading um, on a cheaper fish finder or a smaller fish finder. And ultimately, I'm using the fish finder to find fish. Um, yeah. I, know, so it doesn't make sense going with the cheaper one. I remember we were potting along quite nicely and you looked down, you're like, there's a fish behind us. You cast behind us and then yeah. reeled in a, 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 what was it, like a 900 grammer? Something like that, yeah. But your your fish yeah. finder was uh, incredible. I mean, you know, yeah, it's it's the uh, the lower end. I think it's a hook to seven inch, and it's got side scan, down scan, and then the normal sonar. Um, so yeah, it's way overkill for 
or my little two man three meter fiberglass boat. Um, but funny enough, you'll see in the background there's uh, some kick boats, and I've, I'm mounting my my seven inch uh, <laughs> uh, on kick boats. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. It I works. It works well. You look like you're going to go fishing with a 32-inch plasma, man. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us about your um, what is what for those who don't know what is down like what is regular sonar, what is down scanning, and what is side scanning. Okay, cool. So regular sonar is your it's the oldest sonar I think that's been around. Yeah. You know, your your very first fish finders had normal 2D sonar. Um, and that's really just reading really basic um, radar images uh, you know, from the bottom and then thinking back up. Downscan takes it a bit further where um, you're reading at different frequencies. Now, the, the different frequencies allow the image to come back a lot stronger and a lot clearer. Uh, and so essentially, in uh, very basic terms, I'm not an expert in this, but really basic terms, your, your downscan is going to, uh, bring back an image that is super clear. Uh, I mean, I, I think you remember the trees that we were looking at. We could see yeah. individual branches on the trees. Yeah, we could count them. Um, we could see the fish a lot better. Exactly. And so Downscan has has uh, improved that fishing uh, model on the fish finders tremendously. And do you think and down... Then when you go, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. We've got a bit of a delay. So I try to pick my moment and then it comes straight on top of you. Um, do you think Downscanning is... Chirp sonar, because Chirp also uses a raise, a couple of different frequencies at the same time, sends it down, and then your yeah. image is a hell of a lot clearer. Is it is down scanning Chirp sonar, or is it or is that two different things? Uh, yeah, it, it, it is different because you get down scan uh, units without the Chirp. Um, okay. So so yeah, Chirp. I think it just improves the the actual two D sonar, um, whereas the down scan again. I'm uh, probably not explaining it very well at all, but the down scan is different to yeah. the, the chirp. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then you're getting into the side scanning. Yeah. So obviously down scan, you know, shoots a, a beam straight down, and you've got a cone that you'll you'll see the fish in. Um, side scan is so nice because you can see from both sides of the boat. So on the screen, you'll have a line down the middle of the screen. Um, you'll see the screen, you'll see the water on that, that side, you'll see the water on that side, and it'll show you the individual fish. 2D is great, uh, uh, sorry, downscan is great, but you don't know what side of the boat that fish is sitting on. Yeah, because it's in that cone. The fish. Exactly. So the downscan literally pinpoints, you know, it's on this side, it's, you know, five meters away from you, um, and, you know, three meters to the left kind of thing. So, so you can more accurately kind of figure out where those fish are or where the trees are. Um, so, I mean, it, it's to me, it's a big game changer. And funny enough, side scan is now almost considered old technology with all the new stuff that's coming out. So it's probably time for me to upgrade. <laughs> okay. If you're giving that thing away, you know where to send it. <laughs> um, with, um, with, we've got another question from uh, Jaden Pringle143 says, I fish smallmouth bear, smallmouth in Roy River, ah, Moy River, KZN. That's a good, what's a good smallmouth bait to use during winter? Cool, good question. Um, I'm trying to think if I fished the Moy in KZN. I think I did with one of my good friends, Rolf. Um, didn't catch anything, but I know they're there. So smallmouth in winter are quite fun because you can catch them on just about anything. Um, I've caught smallmouth on, on topwater poppers in the middle, dead middle of winter. Okay. Um, smallmouth are, are crazy. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not too worried about the cold. Um, they, they can actually be more active in the colder month than in the summer month. So that's quite cool. That's why I like the cape because I can fish for bass all year round. Yeah. Um, Large is summer, to, small is yeah, winter. It's the question. Exactly. Um, but in terms of lures, um, it's a tricky one because I throw the same lures that I throw for them in the summer than I do for the winter. But what I like to do, my, my number one go-to lure for a smallmouth is a, a small ned rig. Now, 
if you don't know what a Ned rig is, then go and Google it. Um, but, I mean, it, it's literally the small little thing. You know, it's like half a Senko on yeah. a jig head that, to expand it, basically. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why the fish love it, but uh, you, you can't not catch smallmouth on a Ned rig. You, you really can't. If the smallmouth are there, you'll catch them. Yeah. It's almost guaranteed. Um, and also so yeah, on, a wack, on a wacky, maybe, as well? Wacky will work as well. I yeah. often cut um, Senkos in half and do that wacky thing for, I don't know, it looks like yeah. a stick that moves. It doesn't look like anything, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. picks up fish. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then my other favorite one is a drop shot. And um, Same thing, smallmouth cannot leave a drop shot alone. And, and no one uses drop shots, which it blows my mind. Um, especially down here. I say, oh, drop shot. And people say, what the heck? Yeah, but What's the thing is, shot? there is a bit of a thing because I know with a lot of ASFN videos when they were really big, they said drop shot, drop shot, yeah. drop shot all the time. But when they said drop yeah. shot, they meant a jig head and a, a, and a soft plastic on it. They didn't mean yes. the drop shot that you mean. The yeah. drop shot you mean is Correct. your main line yeah. is here. You've got a sinker at the bottom and in the middle of your main line, you've got a hook with yeah. your lure on it. So it's as your your sinker yeah. holds it down, but it keeps it suspended mid water. That's that's drop shotting. That's a, that's yeah. the American style drop shot, and that's what Adam's talking about. And yeah, Correct. just could you give us Correct. a few tips on that? Because I think it's an extremely. Oh, I've literally watched you use your fish finder, see the tree, mm -hmm. see the fish, stick your drop shot down, and bring up a fish. Like, please, can you give us a couple of tips on yeah. on drop shotting, like mistakes people make, or what you think is the best mm -hmm. practice? Mm -hmm. So the, the biggest thing for me, um, and I think you and I discussed it quite a lot, is the 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 braid versus fluoro versus mono. Um, and I, I think you'll remember, I throw straight braid no matter what I'm fishing. Yeah. Um, I don't and use leaders. Uh, you know, yeah, guys get very scared, especially when they go finesse, drop shot, ned rig. Um, you know, they, they feel Im impulsively com compelled to use a leader because that's what you know magazines say that's what youtube says um and i have not noticed a difference in my my hookups uh, the amount of fish i catch or anything like that um I, i've literally watched fish eat my lure on straight braid in front of me in you know water that's got three four meters visibility and sometimes so, it's quite thick braid you know, that you use yeah, I mean, I use my, my thinnest braid, I use a 20 pound braid, um, you know, and that, that's quite thick for a lot of people. Um, but that's what I use on all my finesse lures. I don't go thinner than that because your, your chance of breaking off, your chance of losing a big fish, if you're using, you know, some guys go down to eight pound fluorocarbon, which, I mean, Shucks, if you hook into a two, three kg bass, you're probably not going to land it. In structure, you won't. probably no. break off. No, absolutely. So to me, it doesn't make sense. Um, the concept of a leader also doesn't make sense because you've got this braid back line and then a really weak piece of line in the front and that's where you're going to break off. So yeah. The whole concept of a leader doesn't make sense to me. But, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's my first biggest thing with, with drop shots. Uh, I just go straight braid, go thin, um, 20 pounds. You can even go to 15 pounds if you really want to go that thin. Um yeah, and then th there's not a lot you can do that's wrong with drop shot. I mean, like you said, it's a small little sink at the bottom, um, and then you hook. The, the type of hook that you use is normally a, a small circle hook. I like to use something, you know, somewhere around a, a two-rand coin size because bass obviously have quite a big mouth. So yeah. a circle hook just allows you, instead of striking, oh, that's the big thing that people do is they strike with a drop shot. Well, with a circle you hook, you shouldn't. Strike. If you're using, you shouldn't strike anyways. Um, but no matter what hook you're using, don't strike when you drop shot fishing. You literally reel in the slack, put some nice pressure into the fish, and, and he's going to be hooked. Um, it's just that simple. If you're using a small, light wire hook, it's going to penetrate the fish's mouth um, no matter what you do. Interesting. So you're going to lose a lot more fish by striking. And the knot you use to tie the hook on in the mid, mid of your, middle of your line, is there a specific knot that you use? Um, yeah, kind of. 
I don't know what it's called. Um, uh, yeah, Google it. I, I don't know what it's called. <laughs> I, I learned. Yeah, Google it. <laughs> I learned the knot when I was uh, fishing. You know, when I was growing up in, in saltwater fishing for small blacktails. Um, and there it's the same thing. You got a big sink at the bottom and like three hooks on the line, and yeah, well, that's where I learned it. So. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> People sometimes tie with that bla with that black tail rig. I know that used uh, they often use uh, what's it called a, a double figure of eight a figure of eight loop knot. They do that, but yeah, yeah. But I know with the bass anglers, especially with some of the articles I've seen, it's actually a particular knot that holds the hook that mm. so that it's um, parallel with the floor. So I think guys, yeah. if you if you're interested in drop shotting, I think it's worth your time. Just giving it a couple of Googles, see what options you've got, what types yeah. of hook. But you've got you've got the the pieces of advice from Mr. Yeah. Bass Anglia. Um, Muhammad is asking, what is your biggest smallmouth bass? Ooh, uh, I've got to remember now. Uh, 2.35, if I remember right. 2.35 kg. Which, for those who don't know, is a bloody big one. <laughs> I've lost your video yeah, for some reason. Pretty big. <laughs> I don't know. There you go. Oh, there I am. <laughs> um, and then we've got another question yeah. here. What do you think about, uh, I think it's called a whopper plopper, but it's spelled W-H-O-O-P-E-R. Mm. Whooper plopper? Whopper plopper? <laughs> whopper plopper. I love the whopper plopper. Um, Can you explain what it is? The original one that, that comes from the States. Yeah, so Whopper Plopper is a top water lure. Um, it's basically something combined between like a top water popper and a propeller vein. Um, so it's got this little propeller at the back that you, you wind along. Um, and it's a fantastic lure for, for big, aggressive fish. Um, I've caught some, some huge fish. And funny enough, my biggest smallmouth came off a Whopper Plopper. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the, the biggest smallmouth love it. <laughs> um, when would you fish it? I use the one from Berkeley. Okay, yeah, you do. Um, where would I fish it? I, I like fishing it along the rocks. Um, I, I don't know what it is, but, you know, any rocky bank, uh, my whopper plopper destroys fish there. Um, when you get brave, you can throw it in between trees and that. Um, yeah, any, any thick structure... I mean, even grass lines, throw it along a grass line, wind it back slowly. Um, and I think the one big thing guys don't do that I, I found that works really well is, is winding it in, you know, three or four winds and then pausing it. Very similar to your topwater frog or any other uh, topwater bait. Uh, but, but winding it in, as soon as it pauses and you leave it for sometimes even 10 seconds or so, um, that fish is suddenly interested. And the minute you wind it back in, that fish is on that lure. Um, I've had a lot of success like that, uh, just, just doing that pause. Yeah, I found a lot of, a lot of um, bass anglers tend to fish quite impatiently. They, they cast yeah. real, 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 cast real, 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 cast, oh, these fish aren't biting. But then you'll watch someone like you or someone like um, Kyle, the, one of the, our previous chats, who would really, real stop, wait for longer than you think you need to wait, and then as you reel in yeah. again, it hits or it hits on the pause. These fish, well, if, I think people, I think all of us, I say as all of us as anglers, need to pay more attention to our watercraft. Watch animals. Like when we've got, um, yeah. when you're watching a real frog, that you've, you're walking along the bank and a real frog jumps in the water, watch it. See yeah. it for a bit. See how it moves. It swims, 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 and then it stops. And it stops for quite a long yeah. time. And then it swims. Bass have eaten many of those. That's why they want to eat our mm -hmm. top water frogs or whatever. Correct. And they also sometimes yep, exactly. are, sometimes the frogs sink down. That's also mm -hmm. something. If if your pop if your top water frog is filled with water, sometimes I've caught a lot of fish where I've let that thing pop 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 on the top, and as it slowly sinks, then yep. the line starts to peel off because the bass has taken it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's we, we've we've got to watch. We've got to watch. We've we've got to learn from the fish because the fish know what's happening. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So we've got another question. What is your favorite brand, Square Bell? Or is it Bill or is it um, Square Bell? Probably meaning Square yeah. well, um, I, I love the Berkeley range of crankbaits. Um, 
again, no sponsor or anything like that. Um, but, but the reason I like them is because you know it's a really good quality bait in terms of the construction and the design. They swim right. Um, you know, a lot of the cheaper ones, you, it'll swim okay, and then it'll suddenly turn to a side. Um, and they're, they're quite durable. I mean, I, I've thrown them onto rocks hundreds of times, and, you know, a lot of the other ones, the, the bills will break off or, you know, the actual lure will split open. But I abuse my stuff. And, and the yeah. Berkeley square balls, they, they, just, they just last. Um, and they catch fish. And that, that's the other big thing. I've won quite a few competitions using the Berkeley square balls and the, the deeper divers as well. Okay. Um, I just I will, I want to go back to crankbaits now, but in case we run out of time, I don't want to run out of time. You do gu a guiding service, hey? You take guys out fishing. Yeah. So please, can you tell yeah. our listeners your details on how to get hold of you for these guided trips? And yeah, a couple of details so that if guys want to go out with that best guy, this lovely Adam, um, you'll, they'll know how to find you. Yeah, cool. Um, well, I mean, you know, you've got my YouTube channel, um, got my Facebook channel, so you can go there, um, and Instagram, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, I take those out whenever I do a lot of international clients um, versus uh, local guys. Uh, number one, because a lot of local guys don't want to pay to go fishing, which I understand. Um, but uh, the international guys, they're here on holiday, they want to go fish, um, and they don't know where to go. So there are a lot of international guys. But, you know, always open to, to take anyone local. Um, plus, uh, I do it during the week, normally not, to, not over the weekend. So yeah. most of the, the local guys are at work. Um, but, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoy the guiding because I get to, you know, help guys at whatever level. I mean, if you, you've been bass fishing for 20 years or you've just started, it's a lot of fun to try and teach someone something new. Um, so yeah, loads of fun. Yeah, and even if you're advanced bass angler, we can still learn from each other. Like, there are, I guarantee you, you'll learn a couple of things from your fishing style and your your theories, yep. your uh, techniques. There's, there's a lot we can learn from each other. Like, when I went out with you, I learned a shit ton. Um, okay, so yep. that's how you find Adam to go on his trips. They, they are in the Cape, if you guys want to go. Yeah. And then... Um, yep. Okay, talking about crankbaits, square bill versus round bill, what is the difference for those who don't know? Okay, so the, the round bills um, are generally the deeper divers. Um, you do get shallower ones, but the, the big thing with a square bill is it deflects um, rocks and trees and things a lot better. Um, so, and the other nice thing is because it's square, if it does hit a rock, instead of just bouncing off it, it'll often hit to the side. Um, and, and that bit of deviation, you know, often triggers a reaction strike in the bass. So square balls to me are just, they're phenomenal baits. Um, if I'm struggling at a dam, I'll pick up a, a square ball and throw it around. And if I don't get any bites in the square ball, then it's probably time to go home. <laughs> okay. You also did some quite, um, what's it called, you, they were? They were, oh, it's gone out of my head now. They were jerk baits. You got quite a lot of fish when we caught when we went fishing yeah. with, with jerk baits. Is there a particular jerk bait yeah. that you would suggest for guys to get? Because I know, I oh, lost it. Hold on, two seconds. Well, different ones. Um, so again, the Berkeley range. I use a lot of the Berkeley range jerk baits, uh, but then funny enough, the the Sensation jerk baits. Um, I, the last time we went fishing, I was doing a guiding trip and I gave a guy um, a Sensation jerkbait, which, you know, Sensation is a, a local brand. Yeah. Um, so a lot of guys, you know, throw their nose up at it. Um, and we were, we were struggling quite a bit. Um, gave him the Sensation jerkbait and, you know, 20 minutes later, he had about six fish um, and we just couldn't stop catching fish on jerkbaits. Uh, so yeah, those, those two, they work very well and they're not going to break the pocket either. No. Um, you know, you're probably looking at, uh, I think they're, I don't know, 120 Rand or so for the Berkeleys. And I think the Sensation's even cheaper, 80 bucks or so. So, you know, versus two, 300 Rand for, for other brands. Yeah, it's a uh, bit rough. going to catch your fish. Especially when that thing can get yeah. hooked on a tree at the bottom and you can't get it up. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's my one thing about bass lures and stuff. They are quite expensive for how many you need as a as a bass fisherman. Yeah. With carp yeah, anglers, yeah. if you've got three reliable rigs, you can pretty much go off on that. But then we also always need to buy bait. I recently made my my first top water lure. I made my own. I was very proud. It's still drying. I'm going to ah. test it later. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Have you ever made your own bait? Your own... Um, lure. Yeah, I, I tried. I've tried a few times um, when I was younger, uh, but uh, I haven't had the time uh, in the last ten years to try that. So, yeah, no, not really. Okay, but it, yeah, I think for for those who are inclined, it's fun to do. For others, it's about catching the fish. So, yeah. um, okay, so yeah. we talked about drop shotting a bit. We talked about crankbaits. So. You also taught me something new when we were there fishing with lily pads. I think you called it punching. What did you call it? Where you had a you had yes. a jig, but then you had a, a very heavy um, lead on it. That when you cast yeah. to lilies, it pushed through the lilies and you fished straight down through the lilies and then you pull that straight out of the lilies. Can you tell us a bit about that fishing and yeah. why you do why you do that fishing? Mm, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's called punching, and for good reason. You, you're punching straight through lilies or thick grass. Um, you know, and again, I see a lot of guys, you know, just going straight past. When, it, when the lilies are thick, they don't even bother. Um, when the grass is that really thick, matted grass, a lot of guys go right past it, and often that's where your biggest bass are sitting, in that, that thick, thick cover. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's basically that I normally use a, a crawfish, Type imitation uh, it normally works the best because it, it, it gets through the grass nicely um, and then like you said a, a big big punching weight um, if you can think of uh, almost like a grape size <laughs> like a small grape yeah that, that's the size weight that you're going to be using it's like a it's like a one ounce one ounce lead yeah yeah exactly um and then, uh, yeah, 60, 65 pound braid. Um, you have to have the thick stuff. And, yeah. and also, again, this is where your, your spinning reels are not going to hold up in that thick cover. Um, the, the chance you get a, a bigger bass out of there is very, very small. Um, yeah, especially when it's really thick. You, you're probably going to lose the fish nine out of 10 times. So, so that's where the casting rods with the, the heavy backbone, um, they, they just come into play a bit better. See, this is where I disagree, but it's okay. We we both got our own opinions because I think, I think in terms of drag, I think the spinning reels and the and the bait casters are are on par. I'm actually I must do I must do a video one day. I must get get yeah. the equivalents and actually test it because I know so some of my reels are actually pretty strong, and then my my yeah. bait my bait cast is also very strong. So I'm, I don't know about that, yeah. but. Guys, listen to the pro. He knows his stuff. <laughs> and then, yeah, if you think, if for those who don't know, for if you think about it, lily pads cover the top like this. They cover it so it's thick, so that it covers up all of the 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 sun, the sun rays. So it's it's it covers a, quite a dense amount on top. But underneath that, it's just little stalks, and the fish. There's not that much underneath, and the fish have got clear pathways. Yeah. There's plenty of space for them to move around underneath. And what Adam does is he Absolutely. he goes through that initial layer, and then he goes to where the fish are chilling, and you pick up you picked up you pick up quite more, quite a lot more fish, where other guys yeah. go past it, and then you've also got that backing of that strong braid, strong reel, strong rod, yeah. so you can once you've hooked it up, you can either pin it there and go and fetch it, or pull yeah. him out of it. Yeah, exactly. And you said you use a, a craw a craw lure to do it like yeah. okay this this is a quite an interesting conversation in my <laughs> opinion because bass are bass they are from they're from america originally hey yeah there's a small debate about that but okay generally, yes. okay they're not okay let's put it this way they're not from here they're not from south they're africa not from here. okay yeah. yeah so a lot of the bait companies the lure manufacturing companies produce lures for American fishing and they've done a lot of research and a lot of yeah. work on these lures and they're great lures and they work for bass fishing. There's no, there's no joke. If you throw a craw crawdad here, yeah. 
a bat will bite it. But why do you think they bite it? Because in their natural everyday life, they would never eat a crawl because we don't have a crawl fish here in South Africa. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. Like there's also other lures that look nothing like something that's alive, like those spinner baits with two spinners yeah. on top and then, <laughs> and then the jig underneath. It, it, it looks nothing like it. Why do you think bass still bite that stuff? Yeah, oh, it's a good question. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a bit of information. We, we do have crawfish um, in some of our waters, especially up north, you know, more in Alsprague area. Do uh, we? There's been guys that have found, yes, the guys have found some big crawfish um, in those waters. I didn't know until about a month ago when I saw a, a thread on a, a post that guys were chatting about it. Um, they're, they're not very common in most of our waters, but there are quite a few waters um, especially up north where it's warmer, um, you know, they've leaked in through, you know, Zimbabwe areas and, and those kind of things. Interesting. Um, so so we, we do, but not not a lot, uh, and not in our main waters, I don't think. Um, but, um, yeah, so the reason why they bite them is because the, the crawfish pattern can represent a lot of different things. Um, it, it, and, and this goes for most lures, um, and that's, I think, where... A lot of guys go wrong when buying bait is because they they buy according to what they think the bass want. Um, you know, they, they see the shiny colors and the nice packaging and they see the brand name and say, oh, that's got to work. Yeah. But realistically, that's not what the fish are looking at. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, a crawfish can represent a couple of things. It can represent crabs, which we've got plenty of in our waters. Yes. Which um, bass do you eat? Love crabs. They love crabs. Um and then also, you know, a wounded bait fish, um, you know, popping off the bottom kind of thing or, or a sick bait fish. Um, it, it can look exactly like that little crawl chilling on the bottom. So, you know, it doesn't have to represent a crawl. Uh, it's same like a stenko represents pretty much nothing. A but, stick. You know, bass love them. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you've got to remember bass are predatory fish, so yeah. they're, they're opportunistic as well. Yeah. So if they see something moving, they're going to try and eat it pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's 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 I think they do think if it's alive and it fits in my mouth, it's going down the hatch. Um Yeah, I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah, I I I do personally think that they are definitely like fly fishing, they are flies for fish and they are flies for fishermen and they are bass lures for Absolutely. bass and they are bass lures for fishermen. Okay, we've got 26 seconds left. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on to the on to the um on to the podcast or the chat. And yeah, guys, get hold of him for any of his videos and for his guiding services. Thanks so much, Adam. Cool. Enjoy. Catch some fish. We'll do. Have a good day. Bye. Cool.